Center and to Peter Street's 2000. It matches your book. <laughs> so hats off. I mean, whoops, no, not hats off. But we would like to send our applause to McMillan Publishing for making this possible and including us on the Fair Street's 2015 tour. So a warm girl is welcome to our fine panel of talent and also to our moderator this evening, Mr. Ben Love. Come on over, Ben. A bit about Ben. <laughs> to begin with, he is a high school English teacher here in Indian River County. And Ben is the bookish co-host of the podcast, The First Million Words. So we're welcome, welcome. We're happy to have you. He's going to introduce the authors. So one more Vero Beach round of applause. We'll get the party started. Okay. Yay. 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 I will just go this way. <laughs> Hi, everybody. <laughs> Is my microphone working? It is. Oh, that's mm -hmm. why. Uh, this is going to be for the ladies. Oh, it's oh, yeah. Emma's book Emma's book Emma's book birthday. Birthday. Oh. Yes. Well, hi, everybody. <laughs> Welcome, and uh, thank you for coming out. Yeah, I'm on a podcast called The First Million Words, and if anybody's not heard of it, you have now, so you have no excuse not to download it. Um, so let me start uh, introducing the ladies that need no introduction. Um, first off... And uh, please tell me if I get anything wrong. We have uh, Born in Jerusalem. Yep. Okay. Good. Check. Uh, so who knows how she got here in Vero Beach. Uh, but that's not the most interesting thing about her. Uh, she's the best-selling author of the Grisha trilogy. Did I say that right? Yes. Thank you. All right. Uh, Shadow and Bone, Siege and Storm, and Ruin and Rising. And she is an actual best-selling Author, at least according to the New York Times. Oh, no. Those has jerks. jerks. <laughs> series also has quite a few uh, interstitial <laughs> volumes. Uh, that's your vocabulary word of the day, interstitial, and I do believe I used it wrong. Uh, she's the author of Six of Crows, uh, the first book of yet another series uh, set in kind of the same universe, correct? Yes. Okay, good, good. Um, still not the most interesting thing. I uh, grew up I'm in L.A. About what the most interesting thing is. <laughs> well, let you decide. Okay. Uh, she grew up in L.A., uh, graduated from Yale. Uh, let's see. What else is interesting? She worked in <laughs> advertising, journalism, and most recently in makeup and special effects. Yes. <laughs> now that might be a contender for most things. I do like that you're reading the bio from my website, but you're making it sound as if you called these facts from the internet. You're like, what else have we got here? <laughs> well, she, she's also known to be delighted, elated, and I'm quoting this one from the bio. Uh, downright giddy when meeting a new fan or reading a review from one. Really? Uh, everybody. <laughs> Lady Bardugo. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Because clearly I need that. What could possibly go wrong? <laughs> I, if you, if you uh, would, can you give us a brief summary of, of uh, Six of Crows, please? Um, yeah, Six of Crows is a heist story. Um, I always describe it as Ocean's Eleven meets Game of Thrones, but I've learned that very few teenagers have seen Ocean's Eleven, so we've gone with Guardians of the Galaxy meets Game of Thrones. Um, it's about six kids, all from very different backgrounds, all with their own prejudices and baggage, who are offered a crazy amount of money to break into a fortress that has never been breached before and break out a scientist who has secrets in his head that could unleash magical havoc on the world. Um, and, you know, they are, there's some trust issues there. Some of them have worked together before and are not happy to be working together again. Um, but they're going to have to if they're going to survive what um, amounts to a suicide mission. So, um, yeah, it's kind of my favorite kind of story. Gang of misfits, found families, that kind of thing. Very nice, high story. And uh, what I want to make sure everybody knows is that it just hit number one on the New York Times bestseller. Yeah. But we all know the New York Times. <laughs> uh, <laughs> crazy your, people. Uh, novels include uh, magic and stuff, am I correct? <laughs> <laughs> they are contemporary realistic <laughs> Somewhere, that's true. Um, picture in the right style, right? Yes, yeah, yes. Yeah. They're all from my own past. Um, <laughs> I'm scared. Yes, they involve a lot of magic and uh, dark dealings and uh, occasionally people getting cut in half. 
That kind of thing. <laughs> Definitely book worth reading. I, I think so. <laughs> so does the New York Times. <laughs> so we have, okay, I have to do this, and uh, other authors keeping note. Uh, I'll, I'll now, why am I the first one? I feel like I'm run through the gauntlet. We, we got uh, Kaz, main character. Yeah. Right? Uh, okay, Hogwarts house for Kaz? Slytherin, for Slytherin. sure. Okay. Yeah, no question. <laughs> Much like me. <laughs> uh, next up, author of Mostly Good Girls, Past Perfect, This Song Will Save Your Life, which was included on the American Library Association's Best Fiction for Young Adults list. Uh, let's see, one of the year's Best YA books by BuzzFeed. And most recently, she's written the Tonight the Streets Are Ours. Uh, hailing from Boston, Massachusetts. Woo! Psychology <laughs> from Chicago. Woo! <laughs> My hometown. Uh, currently lives in Brooklyn. Right? Oh, that's good. <laughs> uh, has worked and still works in children's YA, correct? Yeah. Very good. And publishing. Okay. Uh, she's been known to drag other people into her fantasy world where she likes to ponder the idea of sleep, uh, cuddle kittens, and consume chocolate. Uh, a fantasy world, by the way, where everyone Oh no, knows how to don't take me there! The escalator. Everybody knows how to probably use the escalator? Yes. I do have a lot of escalator phobias. Good. <laughs> uh, she also has, uh, I believe, a history with the game Tetris. Oh, yes. Um, you have done your research. Um, yes, I once organized a hundred people to play Tetris using the windows of a building. Um, it was awesome. Uh, so I, as you mentioned, I went to the University of Chicago, and the University of Chicago is home to the world's largest scavenger hunt. It happens every May. It lasts for four days. The list consists of roughly 300 items, all of which can be found or accomplished within a 1,000-mile radius of Chicago. 1,000? Yes. <laughs> um, so I, I played in the scavenger hunt for a number of years, and when I was playing, one of the items was was um, to play Tetris on the windows of a building, so that was what I did. And then later I went on to be one of, on the panel of judges who runs the scavenger hunt, which means I get to come up with the items, which is really cool. So I've gotten to see a bunch of amazing things that I have asked for. It's kind of just like you put whatever your dreams are on this list, and then um, people make it real for you. So like once I asked for a walk-in kaleidoscope, um, and then I also had an item, which was to make any other item on the list more awesome by using it in conjunction with a trampoline. So somebody put a trampoline inside of their walk-in kaleidoscope. So I've had that experience. Um, I also went, you guys know in High School Musical, the like cafeteria dance scene. So I've had that reenacted in an actual school dining hall. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, you I think you answered every single question I had written down. <laughs> also, and you wrote a book. You use your powers for good. Like you use your powers for whimsy. <laughs> oh yeah, not all the judges do that, guys. There are some judges where the things they want are like what? Monkey's paws and <laughs> <laughs> I, so some really terrible ones are coming to mind that I don't feel comfortable repeating in front of mixed company. Um, oh no! Okay, 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 um, two. Um, once they had people eat their own umbilical cords. <gasps> I'm sorry. Where? What, where would you even acquire such a thing? <laughs> if your parents saved it. Oh. oh God, I hate hippies. <laughs> <laughs> And once they uh -huh. had them, these are not even the worst ones. These are the ones that I am willing to repeat in this company. <laughs> once they had them um, get permanent tattoos that said, sorry about the syphilis, can we still be cousins? <gasps> Actually, no. What is the prize for this scavenger? <laughs> <laughs> not dignity. <laughs> you can get that removed. Is there a prize? That's expensive. <laughs> Glory. Anything to win. So, anyway, <laughs> so, yeah, everybody. I read this book. Can you tell us a, a little bit about the uh, Tonight the Streets Are Ours? Yeah, totally. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, um, Tonight the Streets Are Ours is about a girl who becomes obsessed with a blogger from afar based on what he writes about his life on the internet until ultimately one day she and her best friend set out on a 300 mile road trip to New York City to track down this blogger in person. And over the course of one epic night of adventures together um, all throughout the city, she comes to find that he's not exactly as perfect as he'd portrayed himself as being uh, on his own blog. 
And oh, before we go on, now I know uh, somewhere I did read you described Arden, the main character, as fiercely loyal. Yes. And Lindbergh quote, right? Yeah, the quote is, you're so good, oh my god. <laughs> I'm very good at regurgitating things I've read, yeah. <laughs> things that I said, though, so I really like that. Um, no, so the quote is recklessly loyal, actually. And I, I don't know if any of you guys would have read um, Anne Lindbergh's books. I think most of them are out of print at this point. So this is Anne Spencer Lindbergh. She's the daughter of Anne Marl Lindbergh and Charles Lindbergh, so a very famous family. And she was this really talented middle grade fantasy writer. Like, I just loved her books when I was a kid. And she has this one throwaway line in one of her books where she describes somebody as being recklessly loyal. And I just always thought it was such a perfect line. And I felt that it, like at the time that I read it when I was 12 years old, I was like, that is me. That's what I am. And I, and I took great pride in it at the time. And then as I got older, I was like, well, like there are some drawbacks to that. So that's what I Mm. Of this character, because she's a Hufflepuff. Okay, that's yes. <laughs> I was going to guess. Very loyal, very good. Um, next up, author of the Starcrossed series, which includes Starcrossed, Dreamless, and Goddess. I, I saw a few of those, I think, out in the back there, ready for our signatures. Uh, most recently, the World Walker series, which includes, uh, if I can find my place where I just was. <laughs> so, is it Child Child by fire, fire and you. Firewalker. Firewalker, thank you. Um, from Massachusetts, youngest of eight, which Yay. right there is a. a I got scars. Thing. Yeah. <laughs> uh, graduated from New York University's Tisch School of the Arts and Theater. Okay. Uh, focus on the classics. Okay. Uh, now in Los Angeles with a screenwriter husband. Is that still? That's correct. Very good. Very good. Uh, and a little girl. Yeah. A few loving cats? I have three cats. Very good. Yeah. Um, let's see. Oh, yeah. She also likes to uh, scream sometimes before rewriting. What? <laughs> <laughs> Another thing I read. Um, <laughs> Alright, uh, please, uh, no more asking her if we are going to see more on Helen and Lucas. Uh, Josephine Angelini. Hi. Hi. Yay. So, so are we going to see more on Helen and Lucas? <laughs> it's possible. It, I might. Um, I, I, I don't know if I'm going to come back to that series right away, but um, I might. I could. <laughs> Great, great. So tell us about uh, Trial by Fire and then uh, the, the newest one, Firewalker. Okay, um, Trial by Fire is a story about a girl, Lily, who's taken from our universe and brought into a parallel universe by an alternate version of herself. And when she gets to this parallel universe, she finds out that the other her is an evil witch. And not just kind of evil, she hangs scientists. She's on this mission to hunt down every scientist in her world and hang them. Um, and it is set in virtual Salem's, like a Salem here and a Salem in an alternate universe. And she is the Salem witch, and she's not very nice. So um, Lily sort of says, that couldn't be me. Sort of like when you hear your voice on an answering machine and you go, ah, no, that's not me. <laughs> and she joins a rebel group to sort of That's grow. not me, it's an evil scientist who hangs witches. And uh, she uh, joins like a rebel group to sort of fight against this other version of herself, but um, as time passes and she learns a little bit more about what's going on, she starts to agree with her evil self. So um, that's the, con the conundrum in that is that there's a guy involved and he sort of leads the level rebel group and he used to be in love with the evil version of her and now Lily is starting to become the woman that he hates. That's a little sad. But it doesn't stay that way, don't worry about it. <laughs> so Lily, maybe she hops back So it's kind of a uh, bummer, but <laughs> basically this is sort of, it's a combination of nature versus nurture and um, the idea of, and not so much does that actually create the individual, but which individual, what that individual believes makes them. Like if you believe that it's your nature that makes the universe, then you will make your own choices in the world. If you believe that it's nurture and everything's done to you, and that's what makes me do the things that I do, well, if that's what you believe, then that's the universe that you're going to create. So that's sort of the theme at the heart of the whole thing. Yeah, so, so Lily maybe goes back and forth a little... Lily, Lily doesn't know what the heck uh, is uh, happening to her for a while. No, <laughs> Lily, she... She want, I, she's definitely Gryffindor, but Lillian, the other version, is definitely Slytherin. Okay. 
Oh, it's the bad guys. <laughs> now, uh, the next uh, uh, published author as of today. Woo! <laughs> uh, it, 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 it was really hard to get that hat off. I'm just going to show you. Uh, the most people may know her better from her blogging, uh, where she's known as Elma Fi. Uh, to her many sus subscribers. Uh, also a co-host of the Life Skills channel, How to Adult. And um, we have at least two more books coming out besides uh, our first. Uh, there's going to be coming up, This Adventure Ends, as well as Untitled Emma Mills, book number three. <laughs> so we have uh, Then and Now author Emma Mills. First person, first person, but, but, but the sequel will be called then. What did I call? Then, no. I'm so sorry. That was no, that was in the video. I made a joke that that was what I would call the next one. So that that, that first person, then, then, then. That works great. So what's the what's this one about? Here? So first and then, am I on? See, I feel like I'm a stand-up comedian from like 1992. And so this might be like like a, like Def Jam comedy. Like, <laughs> I really like it. Um, first and then, what I is often described as uh, Pride and Prejudice meets Friday Night Lights. So it's a little bit about sports, particularly football, um, and a little bit about romance. But I think at the, at the heart of the book is, uh, is this kind of, the core of the book is this relationship between the protagonist, Devin, and her cousin, Foster, who has come to live with her family at the start of the story because her, uh, his mother is unable to, to take care of him anymore. And so Devin has sort of lived in this kind of safe bubble uh, for, for as long as she, she has known. And she's an only child, and, and suddenly she has this, this little sibling type person in her life that she has to kind of figure out how to deal with and how to negotiate that type of relationship that she's never experienced before. And it turns out that Foster has this talent for football, and so through him, Devin comes to know, uh, you know a number of different colorful characters from the football team, among them the varsity football captain, who is, who is kind of sullen and reserved. Um, and, and through her relationships with these various people, Devin comes to know, you know more about herself. And, uh, I enjoy it. I think it's great. It's I delightful. Know, it's delightful. It's delightful. So, so uh, Devin, mm -hmm. thinking maybe um, Ravenclaw? Oh, that's interesting. I hadn't thought about it much until yesterday. I would probably put her in, in Gryffindor, but I think she could go a few different ways. Okay. Yeah. Everybody, I think, preferred Gryffindor mostly. I think mostly. you're confused. <laughs> <laughs> so much Gryffindor bias out there. <laughs> All right, so uh, in honor of our book birthday here, we do have a giveaway. Um, everybody, go ahead and look under your seats. Is it a car? There should be a <laughs> car. Yeah, you wish. And you <laughs> want a car? You want to get a car? Come on, Mary, you win. Oh, a car. Thank you very much for coming. If it, nobody tries it under your seats. You are seat. right. There we go. Oh. to our uh, panel of uh, authors here. Uh, can you all maybe give us, did I say y'all? <laughs> you did. It happens, all right. Can we get maybe a, uh, a look into what uh, brought you into writing and uh, how long it took you before that first published book came out and, uh, and where you plan on going from here? Oh, you got the mic. I'm gonna kick it off. Kick it off. Um, so, the, to, to, to summarize, it's how did we get into writing, how long did it take us to, to get to this place, and what, what's coming in the yes. future? Okay, I just want to make sure, I want to hit all the main Triple points. Question. All right, yes. um, what got me into writing? I've been writing for a very long time. Um, I was I was trying to sell my stories when I was in sixth grade. I started I sending them off to publishers, and they would send me these really nice letters being like, we don't really publish the work of children, but we appreciate what you're doing, and we encourage you to continue. And so awesome. I kept continuing. Um, I like the idea of you as like a bitter eight-year-old who's <laughs> like writes angry blog posts about the gatekeepers. <laughs> like, I don't understand my genius. It was, uh, it was character building, I think, and it, it did encourage me to keep going. And so I, uh, I, I wrote all through college. I started first and then when I was still in high school and I finished it when I was in college. And then I, I tried to 
query around for an agent for a long time, and uh, ultimately I found one, which was awesome. And, uh, and then, then it, it became a book. I, so everyone else's journey is probably going to be more interesting and later because mine is just starting. Um, but from here, question part three was uh, what am I going to do next? I, I hope to continue. I hope to have, have many more books and to, to forge a career out of it because that's it's always been my dream. Yay. <laughs> you know, she told me this story last night, and it's so much more layered and nuanced than that. And it was, it's really a really great story, like how she came to publishing. I was like hoping for the long version, but. Um, <laughs> you let me down. I'm sorry. Um, so I, uh, for, well, for myself, I, I started keeping a journal when I was 10, and um, all through my life, basically, I sort of wrote, and I had lots of people that came into my life, and they kept saying, hey, Josie, you're a writer, and I was like, no, 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 I'm not a writer. No. I had professors pull me aside in college and be like, you know you're a writer, right? And I'd be like, no, I can't, I, I could never be a writer. I'm not smart enough. I'm not talented enough. I don't really know what I'm doing. And, and then, you know, even after college, just sort of kicking around trying to figure out what I was doing with my life, I even had several boyfriends, even not very nice guys, who were like... <laughs> You're a writer. You write every single day. I don't know anybody who isn't a, that uh, anybody who does that, and you do it. And I'm like, well, no, no, no. It's just my journal, right? It doesn't. It's not. I'm not a valid writer because I just write in my journal. And then finally, I was like, you know what? I gotta stop like dating guys who write and actually be the writer. And that I, I did. I, I moved to Los Angeles and I was trying to write screenplays because I thought, well, that's where I fit in, right? I studied this theater background, I understand dramatic structure, I studied it, I know how to write, you know, five act drama, and I get it. And then, you know, I was sending stuff out, and there were, I had like a bunch of people that were like, hey, you know you're a novelist? <laughs> and I was like, no, I'm not a novelist, I'm a screenwriter, obviously I'm a screenwriter. And my husband one day, he took, takes me over to my bookshelf, like after a rejection, people that were really interested, and I was like, okay, this is the time I'm going to sell a screenplay. And they were like, nah, you know, because it's not really castable, and we can't really, whatever. I was like heartbroken. Takes me over, and my husband's a screenwriter, and he was like, look at your bookshelf. And I was like, yeah. He's like, how many screenplays do you have? I was like, well, none. I have, <laughs> I have novels. And he was like, write what you love. Oh, that's so, tough. Yeah, he told me to quit my job bartending and take a year and write an idea that I had. And he was like, that would make a really good novel. And it was Starcrossed. It blended, it like sold like that. I didn't know I was I just wrote it and I was like, Oh that was fun, now I gotta go find a bartending job <laughs> to get back out there and um, it actually sold, so that was pretty amazing. So yeah, you know, if you've kept that journal for like since you were ten years old and you're like I could never be a writer, I could never be a writer, you're probably a writer. <laughs> That's the story. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I, my story is somewhat similar to Emma's, which was that I always intended to be a writer. I want to be a writer, an actress, and or a singer. Um, <laughs> triple threat. Yeah. Yeah. I, I was going to be a triple threat. Karaoke. We got to go do karaoke. <laughs> We're definitely doing karaoke I in Toronto. Um, <laughs> you um, said the magic words. <laughs> um, so I similarly. Um, I started submitting my work to publishers when I was 11. I don't think the rejections that I got were anywhere near as kind as the ones you got. They said things like, kid, reject. And I was like, thanks. I don't, um, and anyway, but I, but I kept submitting my works like all through middle school and high school. And I, I mean, I kept writing books. Um, so by the time I graduated from college, I guess I'd written like five um, what, uh, five, like, middle grade novels, um, and so I knew that I needed to get a job, um, because it was, because it was clear to me already at the age of 22 graduating from college, I was like, right, I've spent more than a decade submitting things to publishers and have not yet had any luck, therefore my takeaway is that this could take a really long time and possibly never happen. Um, so I need a job. Like, my plan can't be, like, live in my mom's house until I get something published. Because um, that could be another decade, or two decades, three, like, who knows. Um, so I started working in 
publishing. Um, I got a job initially doing marketing for children's books at Penguin, um, and now for the past like eight years, I guess, I've been an editor of children's and YA books, um, also at Penguin, and I get to work with really great people and super talented authors, um, and and I love it. Um, and, and I still kept writing on the side. I took like a little bit of a break when I first graduated from college. I was like, this is amazing. Like I don't, I don't have homework anymore. I don't have reading to do. I would go to work and I'd get out of work at 5 p.m. and be like, I can do whatever I want until 9 a.m. tomorrow morning. <laughs> so I did whatever I wanted for like six months and then I was like, well that's boring. Like, I wanna... <laughs> So then I, I started writing again um, and the next thing that I was writing that turned out to be um, my first novel, Mostly Good Girls. Um, and I wrote it, I'd written a humor column for my college newspaper um, and really loved it. And so I wrote Mostly Good Girls initially as just like a series of humorous pieces all set at the same school and centered around the same characters. And then oh spun God. out a plotline from that. Um, and, then, and then my agent at a party, he was representing a friend of mine. And I said to him, this was 2009, I guess. So the Laurie Halls Anderson win book Winter Girls had come out had just come out. So I said to him, I was like, hey, I'm writing a book too. It's called, at the time it was called Wayward Girls. I was like, I'm writing this book too. It's called Wayward Girls. Uh, and he said, oh, like Winter Girls. And I said, so much better than Winter Girls. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, because he's the perfect straight man, he said, really? And I was like, no, not really. Are you kidding me? Like, I was like, that's Laurie Hills Henderson. No, it's worse than Winter Girls, but do you want to read it anyway? <laughs> Yeah, right. So um, it's been my agent ever since, and um, this is my fourth book. I have my first middle grade coming out in the spring, and then another Yay. YA after that. And yeah, that's yeah. what I do. <laughs> Yay! Yay. Woo! Um, when you get letters from kids, do you get letters like some yes. from kids? Do you write a nice letter, or are you like yes, reject? Yes, I write. A, I write a nice letter. <laughs> I believe you. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. You could be enacting that whole thing. I be would... like, pay your dues, eight-year-old. <laughs> <laughs> this, this is a tough one I got. Right, I have to suffer and you'll have to suffer. No, I'll make you better. I write nice rejection letters to everybody. Oh. That's, it doesn't help. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, uh, yeah, I always wanted to be a writer when I was a kid. I was an only child and I used to talk to myself constantly. Um, Lila and I will, were talking about this, like, this is just like a trait, like, you're like, I, I have five brothers and six sisters, and they all talk like this. Um, and I still, I still, the way I build stories is I, um, I talk them out, and I actually just put my Bluetooth in for my cell phone and pretend I'm on the phone with somebody as I walk yes. down the street. So, yeah, so people don't think you're nuts. Yeah, you do an awesome trick. Um, yeah, yeah. I'm having an important conversation. I think Forget it. I would look like a lunatic if I didn't do that. Yeah, the trick is not to go to the gym. Um, but, uh, yeah, but um, yeah, I, I always wanted to be a writer. Uh, but the problem was I did not know how to write a book, and I didn't think I needed to sort of learn how to write a book. Um, I would start a lot of things. I'd get an idea, and I would get a chapter or two in, or 50 pages in, and then I would lose momentum. And I think there were two reasons for that. One is that um, it's sort of like it's sort of like when you go running. I assume, um, but it's like you get She's out there marathons. Don't let them fool you. And but you get out there and you're like you start running and you're like oh my god this is amazing I could run forever and then like 30 seconds later you're like I want to die. Um, and that's sort of like writing a book. Like you have this initial rush of inspiration and excitement and momentum. Um, that comes with having the big moment, the big idea, um, but then that dissipates and you need to find the next moment of inspiration and you need to work through the moments where there is no inspiration and where it feels like you're writing something crappy, which is the second reason, which was that I didn't understand that all of these were not first drafts. Like, if you go to the movies and you see a writer writing, what do you see? You're like, oh, they get the idea, and then they're like, type, 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 type. <laughs> or they're like, they go through a breakup, and they're like, ah, type, 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 type. 